vitamin B12. And this just shows you, from that she was able to figure out the chemical formula, the chemical, actual chemical structure of vitamin B12, and shows you what a complicated uh, structure it is. And here's the cobalt atom. And those atoms that I showed you here were part of these surrounding atoms of the cobalt over here, okay, which is this uh, ring. <clears throat> now, you can do this for vitamin B12, and Dorothy Hodgkin was one of the best in the world at this sort of thing, and vitamin B12 has a few hundred atoms, and uh, that uh, remar was a remarkable feat for, this, for, for its time, and because of the importance of these compounds, and also because of the uh, advancement in the method, uh, she was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1964. But if you have something much bigger, like a protein molecule, now protein molecules have thousands of atoms, and also they don't have any special atom. Typically there's no cobalt. Occasionally there'll be proteins which have zinc or, or, or iron or something, but the uh, amount of scattering from those compounds uh, at the time was not huge. Now actually it turns out you can use it using synchrotrons, but in those days uh, the excess scattering uh, didn't seem to be very high. So this led to an idea called the heavy atom isomorphous replacement method. And this was invented by Max Perutz along with his PhD student and colleague um, John Kendrew. Well, his, he was form, a former PhD student who then went on to become his colleague. And the idea behind it is this. Supposing you take your, a protein crystal and you measure the diffraction uh, experiment. So you'll get a bunch of spots and each spot will have an amplitude. Now you, the problem with the amplitude is you don't know the direction of the scattering vector for that spot because you don't know the phase angle. Now you can do the exact same thing with the same protein crystal but to which you've added some heavy atom like mercury or gold or something like that. Now, the genius of Max Perutz was that he realized that even though you have only a single gold atom or mercury atom among over, you know, a few thousand uh, light atoms, you would still be able to see a difference in the signal. And from the difference, you could figure out where the gold or mercury atom was, okay? Now, the point is that when you've added the gold atom, the uh, resulting scattering should be the sum of the scattering from the heavy atom uh, plus the sum of the scattering from the protein. So if, you, if the scattering from the heavy atom is here and the scattering from the protein is here, then the uh, total sum should be over here, okay? Now, the problem is you have no, you, you can figure out from the heavy atom, once you know where the heavy atom is, you can get both the direction and the amplitude of this vector from the heavy atom. But you can only measure the magnitude of this protein scattering vector and this FPH, which is protein plus heavy atom, you can only measure the magnitude. You cannot, you don't know what direction they have. But the trick is, you could draw a circle from this point uh, with the radius FP. So that's this blue circle here. And you could draw a circle with, from this point, which is the other end of the heavy atom vector, with the radius FPH, and that's this pink circle here. And the point is that only where these two circles intersect will this vector relationship be satisfied, okay? And so now you know that the phase angle for the protein has to be either this or this, okay? Those are the only two possible directions for the phase angle. And if you were to do this a third time, then with another heavy atom which bound in a different place, then you would get a third circle. And that would intersect only in one of these two places, okay? In practice, of course, because of errors, it doesn't quite work out that way and they have to do some probability of which is the most likely phase angle. But that's the basic principle, okay? And that allowed Perutz and Kendrew to determine the phase angle for all of the spots that are thousands of spots when you collect data from a protein crystal and they've measured the amplitudes and so from that <clears throat> they were able to 
saw the structure of a protein. And this is a picture of Max Perutz and Kendrew. And this is Max Perutz's wife, Gisela. And uh, Max, among other things, went on to found the MRC Lab of Molecular Biology, where I work. And he was also the PhD advisor of Francis Crick. And, you know, and Kendrew uh, worked with him. And uh, the lab is remarkable in that about 14 uh, Nobel Prizes have gone to just this one lab uh, that Max Perutz founded. And this is during his prize ceremony where these are their marbles. At that time, hemoglobin, which Max Perutz worked on, was not yet solved to atomic structure. So he represented it simply as a kind of image, you know, three-dimensional image, which they used to make by cutting up balsa wood to represent the protein structure. This, John Kendrew had already interpreted myoglobin to atomic, in, in atomic structure terms. And there, uh, he's got an atomic wire diagram, uh, a wire model of the, uh, of myoglobin. And you can see Gisela is pinning a flower on uh, Max's uh, suit, and they all seem to look rather happy. Now, <clears throat> in the meantime, once hemoglobin and myoglobin were solved, a few years later, lysozyme was solved, and then uh, more and more proteins started, started to be solved. And, you know, eventually people started trying to attack bigger and bigger questions. And one of the problems that I've been interested in is the ribosome, which is a large machine, molecular machine with uh, over a million atoms that uh, translates the genetic code to make protein. And in order to solve this, you needed a, a few improvements. One is that people like Hakan Hope worked with Ada Yonat to keep the crystals very cold so that when you were hitting them with x-rays, the crystals wouldn't get as damaged. The rate of damage uh, would be a lot less. And so the idea is still to take your crystals and collect data, and then uh, these data are collected on what's called a CCD detector. And uh, the, in order to get data from these very large molecules, which don't diffract very strongly, I mean, for sodium chloride, you can even use a dentist x-ray uh, set, and you'd still get a diffraction pattern. But uh, for something very large like the ribosome, you need very powerful sources of x-rays, and these are you know, four synchrotrons we've used. And notice that they're uh, near New York, near Chicago, near a lot of skiing in France, if you like skiing, and also in Switzerland. And so I often would joke that you could join a ribosome lab and see the world. But this, you know, this is a, a joke on a, an advertisement that the US Navy used to have, which is join the US Navy and see the world. And, and of course, you know, if you join the U.S. Navy and see the world, what, you're not actually seeing the world. You're seeing this inside of a, some horrible battleship, you know, and you're working under terrible conditions most of the time. And these people also, they're just seeing the world synchrotrons, you know. They're not actually uh, going, they have no time to go sightseeing. Uh, because when they're given beam time, they have to work around the clock. And so, uh, this is what the inside of a, a synchrotron we've often used look like. And the x-rays come in here and the uh, crystal is held here. This is a stream that holds the crystal at very low temperature, at near liquid nitrogen temperatures. And then this is a, a modern uh, area detector uh, based on a pixel array, which uh, directly measures the uh, X-ray intensity as a function of uh, at different scattering angles. Now, I s discussed some of this this morning, what you get when you do this experiment is a three-dimensional image of the object, but you still have to interpret it in atomic terms, and this is just to show you uh, how that sort of interpretation has been done. So here, for instance, are two ridges or two chains which uh, seem to have some regular bumps on either side, and the chains seem to meet, and you know they seem to interact in the middle. And so you can see how this has been interpreted as a double-stranded RNA helix. And just doing this, 
the structures of both subunits of the ribosome, which, you know, the ribosome consists of two subunits, were determined in 2000, and then the entire ribosome was determined uh, in 2006. Uh, actually, an empty form of it was uh, de determined a year earlier, in 2005. And this was also used to, uh, you know, determine where a number of antibiotics bound to the ribosome and so on. Now, getting crystals is a very difficult uh, problem, and the more complex your biological assembly is, the more difficult it is to get it to crystallize. And even when you get crystals, you find many of them are not of sufficient quality to give you the kind of detailed information to produce an atomic structure. And, and this is because the atoms and the molecules in the crystal lattice don't sit in exactly the same orientation. They're slightly off from each other, and so the result is an averaging of all those orientations, so that results in a fuzzy picture. And it's only when they're very precisely the same orientation that um, you can get sufficient detail. Now, I, know, I told you that x-rays are used because they have a wavelength that allows you to capture detailed information, which you cannot do with uh, optical light. But uh, another, another wave that you can use uh, is electrons. We've known for a long time that electrons are waves since uh, Louis de Broglie. And so since, since de Broglie, uh, we've known that um, you know, electrons can be waves. And um, short, you know, soon afterwards, it was verified that electrons are waves. But <clears throat> it was not until much later that this man, Ernst Ruska, and his colleagues uh, invented the electron microscope, where they would use the wave properties of electrons to actually uh, magnify things to very, very high magnification. And this is a, a picture of one of his early microscopes. Now, he invented it in 1933, but, you know, the Nazis were in power in 1933, and soon after that, World War II broke out. And after the war, uh, lots of other groups had, uh, you know, started developing microscopes. So, people must have forgotten about who invented the electron microscope. And I guess the Nobel Committee must have woken up in, 1980, in the 1980s and realized that, hey, we've forgotten this very important discovery. And so this is a guy who had to wait uh, 53 years, you know, to, uh, to get the Nobel Prize. And if they waited two years more, he would have been dead, and then he wouldn't have gotten it. Okay? And so, uh, you know, Chandrasekhar is another example. He, you know, a lot of his most brilliant work was done when he was a PhD student and early scientist. And then he had to also wait about 40 or 50 years before he got the Nobel Prize. And he was actually somewhat angry about it. He said, what use is it to me now? You should have you know, given it to me 50 years ago. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, uh, that's Ruska. So how does, how does electron microscopy work to make three-dimensional uh, images of molecules? Well, <clears throat> a big breakthrough was made when Aaron Klug, who was my was a former director of the LMB, of the MRC lab where I work. He was also a postdoc of Rosalind Franklin, which is uh, interesting. He realized that when you make a, an image from an electron microscope, it's essentially a two-dimensional projection of the object. So you have an object, and if you look at an image, it'll be like looking at a two-dimensional projection. And if you look at it from a different direction, you would get a different two-dimensional projection. So imagine, you know, if you're looking at my hand this way, you'll get one particular image. And if you look at it this way, you'll get a completely different view of my hand. But of course, you know, in a two-dimensional projection, you're adding up all of the slices, whereas here you're only seeing the edge of my hand. That's the difference. So what he realized is that if you take these two-dimensional projections and do a Fourier transform, then it would be like a plane in the three-dimensional Fourier transform of the entire object, okay? And so if you were to take all possible two-dimensional projections, then you would be looking at, you would be collecting all these planes in the three-dimensional Fourier transform of the object. 
And then, if you now back transform all those planes, you would get back the original object, okay? Because you, there's a theorem in mathematics that the Fourier transform of the Fourier transform is the original function, okay? So, that is how he uh, obtained the first three-dimensional pictures of uh, molecules. Now, the problem with this is that you have to obtain multiple images from the same object, okay? Because you, of course, you're not going to rotate the electron beam because the microscope is fixed. But what you do is you tilt the sample so you get different views as you tilt the sample. And there's also a limit to the angle with which you can tilt because you can't go 100, you know, completely 90 degrees because then it, the, the holder in which the sample is held would hit the beam. So there's a limit to which you can do this sort of thing. But anyway, the other pro so the one problem is that electrons are highly damaging. And so if you have to collect multiple images from these molecules, then you will damage the electron sample before you have finished your experiment, you know, and you won't get a detailed structure. Partly to avoid this, what Klug and others did was they would coat their sample with stain. This is something like urinal acetate as a typical stain. So you have uranium atoms that completely cover your molecule. And these uranium atoms have very high contrast for electrons, so you don't have to use as many electrons to, your, to hit the sample. So you're not damaging the sample as much. The disadvantage is, first of all, the sample is dried out. You know, most biological molecules like to be in an aqueous environment, and you don't know what happens to them when they're dried out. But the other disadvantage is that you're only getting a picture of the envelope of the molecule. You're not getting any idea of the internal structure of the molecule. So the way around both of these problems was a method called the single particle reconstruction method. And in that method, what you do is you take your sample, which is in uh, an aqueous solution, and you blot away the sample so that only a very, very thin layer of the sample is left. This thin layer is only a few hundred angstroms thick. Now, inside that layer, these molecules can be in random orientations. So when you do the experiment, this is what the images would look like. Now, if you look at these images, these are different projections of the same molecule. So this is a projection through here, here, and here. The problem is you don't know what these orientations are to begin with. But people have worked out tricks so that, I mean, mathematical methods, so that as long as you know it's the same molecule, you can figure out from the data which orientation uh, each of these projections corresponds to. And that means you can figure out that this, this image corresponds to looking at the molecule from this direction, and this molecule uh, projection corresponds to this direction, and this molecule corresponds to this direction, okay? Because the molecules are all in different orientations. And so this is figuring out the orientation just from the two-dimensional projections. And that's something that people figured out starting in the mid-70s, early 70s, uh, up to uh, the 80s or so, through the 80s and 90s. Now, using this, pe people like Joachim Frank figured, showed that you could get three-dimensional images of the ribosome. And even though crystals of the ribosome had existed for 15 years at, at this point, in 1995, these were actually the most detailed images that we had of the ribosome. Of course, soon after that, crystallography took over and produced very detailed atomic uh, images. But even in 2009, the ribosome was still more detailed than this. Here you can see it's very, very uh, coarse and, and the image is not very well resolved. Here you can start seeing many more detailed features, but it's still not at a level where you can build an atomic structure. So two things have changed recently. One is that there are better electron detectors. The reason this is important is that it means that you don't have to expose as much. You don't have as much radiation damage. And you can get, for the same amount of radiation damage, you can get much better signal to noise, okay? Or for the given signal to noise, you have much le less radiation damage. So 
So it improves your experiment dramatically because these detectors are more sensitive than film. And they're also much faster than film, so they can compensate for the movement of the objects uh, when electrons hit them. As soon as electrons hit them, uh, hit a sample, the, the particles start to move because they start getting ionized. And as soon as they start getting ionized, they experience local electric fields and, and, and start to move. And another uh, advance has been better image processing. And I should point out that one of the uh, the better, one of the improved detectors was also developed at my uh, institute by Richard Henderson and Wazi Faruqi. So using these advances, we were able to take a, a new kind of ribosome, which is the mitochondrial ribosome, which we were never able to even get enough material to crystallize. And even after we had purified it, it was not pure. It was always contaminated with cytoplasmic ribosome. And we were able to do this new methodology and get very, very detailed uh, images, three-dimensional images, which we, into which we could fit atomic structures. So you can see that these images are extremely detailed. You can even see a magnesium ion. So the remarkable thing is this is all done with no crystals, with very small amounts of material. And using this, we were able to build the entire yeast mitochondrial ribosome. So for the first time in 100 years, we have an alternative for these large biological molecules uh, to crystallography. Uh, of course, you know, we all know about NMR. NMR has been also used for three-dimensional structures of proteins. But NMR is not a direct imaging technique. It relies on knowing the chemical properties and the sequence of residues of a particular type of chain. So it's not actually looking at the structure. What it's saying is this atom from this residue is close to this atom and this residue. And by a set of constraints, there's only one way that the uh, chain can fold and, and the residues can be where they are. But as far as a direct imaging technique, and NMR cannot be used for very, very large molecules. In fact, 100 kilodaltons is really absolutely the upper limit uh, so far for a de novo structure. And so, for the first time, we now have uh, an alternative to crystallography. And what this means is you don't need as much material, you don't need as, much, as many crystals, you don't need to crystallize it at all, you don't, and you don't need as much material. But the main thing is that you could also have mixtures. For instance, you may have a very complicated complex which is only transiently stable. So when you make the complex, only some small fraction will be in the fully assembled state. Now, if you do an electron micros microscopy experiment, you can computationally sort them out into groups and figure out uh, the structures of all of the different groups. And recently, we've published two papers, uh, one in cell and one in molecular cell, in which, <clears throat> in the first paper, it was about 3 to 6 percent of the sample was the structure we wanted. And in the second paper, it was about 1% of it. So only one out of 100 molecules was the one we wanted. The others were all ones where uh, some factors were missing or it had fallen apart and so on. Another thing is that molecules are conformationally variable. And they can exist in multiple conformations. And with electron microscopy, you can actually determine all of these uh, conformations in your experiment. So. Uh, with that, I'd like to stop, and, and because I've taken you on a sort of 100-year journey and, and, and showed you some of the highlights along the way. Thank you very much. Um, is there any questions? Maybe one or two, otherwise we'll get on to the next part of the function. There's one there. Yes, uh, Sunday. Uh, I, I won't be right by the way. Let me get to my microphone. When you are talking about the penicillin four-member ring, by Dorothy Hoskins X-ray crystallography. 
uh, Professor Woodward actually the one who proposed the structure and he synthesized the molecule. Who? Professor who? Woodward? Yes. Woodward. At Harvard? Yes. Same goes to him for the vitamin B12 synthesis. He employed 70 plus people and had 100 steps. Oh yeah, yeah. Even so, even vitamin B12. And interesting enough, uh, Woodward? Yeah, no, I, I agree. In, in many of these cases, there were important contributions by synthetic organic chemists as well, and biolytical chemists. So for instance, vitamin B12 uh, was uh, also worked on by Alexander Todd, okay? And Todd would ignore Dorothy Hodgkin's findings, you know, and pretend that, you know, they didn't exist, and pretend that he had figured it all out by himself. And so Dorothy Hodgkin would make it a point to sit in the front row every time he gave an important talk to make sure that he acknowledged that a lot of his information was, you know, actually obtained by uh, the crystal structure. Because, you know, he, had, he, he couldn't be sure. Many of these guys couldn't be absolutely sure of what they had because there's a complex molecule. They would have to break it down and, and do the analysis to figure, figure that out. Yeah. So I agree, there's always a, a debate about who did what. The, the reason I mention this is because R.P. Woodward got Nobel Prize next year after Dorothy Hosking. Yes, but that was, Woodward got it for his contributions to organic synthesis, okay? It was not for any particular molecule, but for his general contributions to synthesis. So you have uh, very, very nicely in a simplified manner taken us through the 100 year journey. But uh, the recent findings on high resolution fluorescence nanoscopy, how do they take uh, this uh, area of resolution? That's a very problem? important thing. So, you know, when the Nobel Prize was uh, awarded to super resolution microscopy, or what you call uh, nanoscopy, they, they, uh, had, they said that they had figured out how to uh, break the law of physics called the Abe limit, you know, which is this lambda over to the half wavelength limit. The reality is they're not actually imaging the object. What they're doing is they're putting fluorescent compounds, uh, you know, atta they're attaching fluorescent labels to molecules inside cells. <coughs> and then they're measuring the fluorescence. The nor normally, if you have two floors which are more than lambda over two apart, you won't be able to s distinguish them. But by using some very clever physics, they were able to, to narrow the location of each floor. And so with that, they were able to break the, they were able to distinguish two fluorescent uh, you know, sources that were closer uh, than the lambda over two criteria. And doing that, they were able to get to you know, a few uh, nanometers in, re in resolution. Of course, that's not enough to get an atomic structure, but it's much, much beyond the 500 nanometers or 250 nanometers that you would get from a uh, light microscope. So by uh, an order of magnitude or, or almost two orders of magnitude more. So it's a very important, you know, in incredibly important uh, advance in cell biology, because in cell biology, there are many ways now to label molecules. In fact, even by uh, you know, there are proteins which glow, like GFP, that you can attach to any other protein of interest. You can also introduce fluorescent groups and so on. But it's not a way of looking at the molecule per se. You're looking at the fluorescence from the molecule. So there's a slight distinction there. Oh, well, it was a wonderful under here, Jani. Sorry? Is, uh, is there a, what is your comment about the chloroplast ribosome? Because the descendancy is different. Um, but the size and every structure is same. Yeah, so people have asked whether I want, um, you know, we did bacterial ribosomes and we've also worked on human, you know, mammalian ribosomes and yeast ribosomes and, the, and then we did the mitochondrial ribosome and the question is whether we should do the chloroplast ribosome and I said, well, actually somebody should do it but I'm not going to do it. And, but, but chloroplast ribosomes are, are going to be uh, closer to bacterial ribosomes than mitochondrial ones but they're going to be somewhat different, okay? So they, they, like mitochondria, have also evolved from some symbiotic event, and, so, and they've also diverged. But uh, they're somewhat more closer to bacterial ribosomes than are 
uh, mitochondrial rise. Okay. Although they're both diverged. Uh, I think we have to get on with the points. So maybe uh, we'll have questions in the team. And I'm going to request uh, Professor Ramakrishna if you can just take a seat. And I'm going to request uh, Professor Satmuthi and Professor Chandra Masai to uh, kindly join in the dais. <coughs> I'd like to first invite uh, Chandrima Saha, if you could come over and uh, say a few words and maybe hand over the... It is indeed a great pleasure and privilege for me to read the citation for the Jawaharlal Nehru Birth Century Medal awarded to Professor Fenkit Raman Ramakrishnan. <coughs> The Indian National Science Academy had instituted the Jawaharlal Nehru Birth Centenary Medal in the birth centenary year of late Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru in 1989, the first Prime Minister of Independent India. Pandit Nehru was responsible and instrumental for giving a major push to the growth of Indian science and technology. The Jawaharlal Nehru Birth Centenary Medal has been awarded since 1990 for making contributions to international cooperation and public understanding of science and technology. The award is made once in three years and scientists from all nations are eligible for consideration. The award carries a plaque and a citation and it is one of the prestigious international awards of the academy bestowed upon distinguished overseas scientists. The medal for the year 2016 is being awarded to Professor Venkatraman Ramakrishnan President of the Royal Society of London and Deputy Director of Medical Research Council, Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, for his outstanding work on the atomic structure of the ribosome. Professor Ramakrishnan grew up in India, where he received his bachelor's degree in physics before moving to USA in 1971. On obtaining his PhD in physics in 1976, he switched to molecular biology, and after a long career in the US, he moved to Cambridge in 1999 to work at the LMB. He is best known for his work on ribosomes, the large molecules in all cells that read genetic information to make proteins. Professor Ramakrishnan is a fellow of the Royal Society, a member of European Molecular Biology Organization, the US National Academy of Sciences, Diopoldena, the German Academy of Sciences, and a foreign fellow of the Indian National Science Academy. He received his Louis Janter Prize for Medicine in 2007 and shared the Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2009. With that, I would request uh, Professor Ramakrishnan to receive the citation. Thank you very much, it's a great honor. Thank you. I'd like to request Professor Satyamurti if you would like to uh, hand over a token of our appreciation to Professor Ramakrishna, please. Thank you. It's been a wonderful uh, day today, uh, and there's nothing better than ending it with a Nobel lecture, uh, lecture like this from a Nobel laureate. Uh, I now invite you all for a cup of tea outside. Uh, just a small long.
announcement there's a lecture tomorrow at 11 o'clock at Punjab University a public lecture entitled on nobody's word uh, and then there's a uh, 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 more technical talk uh, on at 430 limited